Hi all, welcome to the NOAA OMIC seminar series. We will get started on the hour. Alrighty, let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Hello everyone, and thank you for joining today. Welcome to the NOAA OMIC seminar series. I'm your host, Nicole Miller, and I sit within NOAA Ocean Exploration. OMICS, which is a suite of tools used to analyze DNA, RNA, proteins, and metabolites, has become a large priority here at NOAA in the past few years. We established this seminar series in an effort to increase transparency and collaboration and highlight the incredible omics-related research currently underway 
both within and outside NOAA. Most seminars from the series are made available on our YouTube and posted on our NOAA OMICS website. There should be a link to the website in the chat now. As participants, you are muted, but feel free to type questions in the questions for staff box throughout the presentation. And at the end, I will read the questions for the presenters to answer. So with that, our presentation today is titled, A Marine Heat Wave Drives Significant Shifts in Pelagic Microbiology, a story based on a decadal national effort of marine microbiome observations in community environmental indices by Dr. Jody Van, Van de Kamp and Dr. Lev Bodrossi. I'm gonna go ahead and um, allow them to set up their slides while I review some um, biography. Dr. Jody Van de Kamp is a research scientist employing omics technologies to study microbial ecology and its utility for ecological monitoring particularly in determining long-term trends in estuarine and ocean health. Omics observations from environmental samples is revolutionizing biodiversity sciences and ecosystem biomonitoring efforts. Jody's research is focused on advancing the use of these data for high spatial and temporal resolution biodiversity observations and the development and deployment of simple metrics to track change in the environment. Through engagement with national and international omics communities, Jody also, work, Jody also works towards the development of workflows and standards to promote trust and interoperability in, of omics data. Jody leads the IMOS Marine Microbiome Initiative Facility, is on the Australian Microbiome Science Team, and sits on the Ocean Biomolecular Observing Network Scientific Advisory Committee and are an endorsed program of the UN Ocean Decade. Lev's current research aims to better understand the status and trajectory in, of marine and estuarine micro, microbial ecosystems. He is developing and applying genomic ap approaches to study marine and estuarine ecosystems to monitor environmental health and the environmental effects of human activities. Lev completed his PhD at the BRC in Hungary working on thermophilic methane oxidizing bacteria and their biotechnological application. Following his PhD, he spent three years at the Department of Biotechnology of the University of Segs in Hungary. In 2000, he moved to the Australian Research Centers slash Australian Institute of Technology, where he, where he pioneered the development and application of microarray technologies for microbial diagnostics in environmental and food applications. He joined CSIRO in 2010 to provide scientific leadership, at, um, to provide scientific leadership, um, and then recently established the environmental genomics team, which he led between 2013 and 2020. Thank you, Jody and Lev, for presenting today. And I will now pass it off to you. Fantastic, thank you, Nicole. Um, you can see our slides okay and hear us okay? Yes, we can see your slides and hear you okay. Excellent, um, good morning, everyone. It's 5 a.m. here in Tasmania, off the very bottom of Australia. So I haven't had my caffeine yet, so excuse me if I stumble a little bit over this. We we're really excited to get the invitation to talk today um, and really pleased uh, to be able to be here to present. Uh, so through the talk today, sorry, we're just having a moment with the slides not moving. All good. Um, we're, gonna, we're going to talk about the um, IMOS, Marine Microbiome Initiative Facility and Australian Microbiome. Um, I'll give an overview of those. Uh, and then Lev is going to talk about the recently published paper with the species and community environmental indices, um, marine heat waves, and then um, go into detail on that paper. And so first off, the IMOS Marine Microbiome Initiative Facility in Australia Microbiome. So I always like to start out by um, thanking all of the people, um, that big community we have and the institutions that have made this work. Um, 
possible. Uh, there's a lot of people that have uh, put investment and effort and um, their vision into making this happen. So I know that you're all joining us today to hear about the exciting research that we recently published, um, but we also wanted to share with you the foundations for that work and how it was made possible. And this is a decadal national and collaborative effort for sustained marine microbiome observations. It's sometimes difficult to know where to start the story, so I'm going to begin at the end. Um, and at the moment, right now, we have the Australian microbiome, uh, which we see as a national framework data set. Um, it, the AM has four core and equal investment partners, and that's um, Bioplatforms Australia, uh, IMOS, which is the Integrated Marine Observing System, CSIRO, and uh, Parks Australia. And it's a database for Australian microbial diversity data. Now, it's not just marine, it also covers samples from uh, the terrestrial sphere, freshwater, hosts, um, in terms of marine, it's pelagic, it's also coastal and estuarine. We provide standardised data analytics as, and workflows. Um, it's all open access data from the moment that it's sequenced, and we provide some really simple tools for data access and data analysis. The IMOS Marine Microbiome Initiative is the core marine data stream within the Australian microbiome. If you're not familiar with IMOS, since 2006, IMOS has been routinely operating a wide range of observing equipment throughout Australia's coastal and open oceans, making all of its data accessible to the marine and climate science community, other stakeholders and users and international collaborators. IMOS currently has a portfolio of 13 facilities, and it's these facilities that undertake systematic and sustained observing in Australia's marine estate. These observations range across the physical, chemical and biological properties of our oceans. I'm sure I don't need to tell the audience here today uh, why we put so much effort into providing these observations, um, but we really want to understand the feedback loops between microbes and the environment, how this impacts on nutrient cycling, primary productivity, and what does this mean throughout the food chain? And it's especially critical now as the world's oceans are undergoing rapid change. How do we do it? Uh, well, for completeness, I've just popped this slide in there. A lot of the marine sampling is typically from small boats. Um, and we do do some work from larger research vessels for the open ocean data sets. Uh, and it's just a basic metabarcoding workflow. We collect the samples, um, we filter up two litres generally onto a Sterovex filter, extract the DNA, amplify taxonomic markers, um, which we put through high throughput sequencing, bioinformatic processing and um, species identification. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of the Australian microbiome because it didn't start with a bang. Um, it started off a lot uh, more slowly um, and it's evolved over time. And it started out with just a few passionate and young scientists more than a decade ago. Um, it was some Australian Research Council funding as well as institutional funds and the goodwill of IMOS to start collections from just three of the national reference stations that they run on the east coast of Australia. Um, momentum as well as the community grew and in 2015 IMOS and Bioplatforms Australia co-invested into what was then called the Marine Microbes Project. And the next step was in about 2019 when um, the Marine Microbes Project became an official facility within IMOS and that was a really exciting step for us because that um, really brought to the front how important those observations were and a sustained um, level of funding for that work. To give you a little bit more context about where the data comes from, um, the IMOS National Reference Stations is the largest time series data set that we have. Those national reference stations are located purposefully in important bioregions around Australia. And these are recognised to have different oceanic features, nutrient properties and biological communities. We began collecting along the East Coast in 2012, and then this was expanded to the rest of the coast in 2015. Samples are collected mostly monthly and from surface to bottom of the water column. And 
most importantly, there's a real abundance of rich metadata that goes along with those samples in terms of the physics, the chemistry, um, traditional plankton counts and flow cytometry and pigments, um, which is all collected at the same time. In 2020, IMOS invested in beginning some time series observations in a few key coastal sites. Um, you know, we, we know that the coasts are the key interface for marine microbes and human population. Um, and these sites were chosen through a consultative community process to, um, to look at three priority areas based on human, economic and science impact. Um, and really importantly, those areas had to have co-investment from the people collecting the samples. Uh, so this began in 2020 um, and includes the Great Barrier Reef, uh, Botany Bay in New South Wales um, and Port Phillip Bay in Victoria. And this is what uh, the IMOS Marine Microbiome Facility looks like today. It looks like a bit of a complicated workflow, but this workflow is what makes it possible for us to have a standardised um, flow of activities and to produce these national scale observations. So we have sample processing at the national reference stations, at the coastal sites. These samples then go out to the bioplatforms sequencing facilities where there are standardised workflows. The data then flows back into the bioinformatics sub-facility and from there it's um, put into the Australian microbiome. And because that Australian microbiome is bigger than just the IMOS data set, we also have other marine data that comes from, for example, the CSIRO, Marine National Facility voyage data, um, as well as I mentioned before, terrestrial and freshwater spaces. What data do we provide? Uh, well, amplicons, um, 16S, both um, bacterial and archaeal. Uh, 18S, B4, um, ITS just for the soils. Uh, we also have short read metagenomics from some of the samples. The data is provided um, as raw fast cues through the Australian microbiome. Um, we also provide all of that metadata that's collected alongside those samples, so that really rich environmental data as well as sample specific um, metadata, so exactly how that sample was collected, how it was extracted, sequenced, etc. Uh, all the methods are written up in an Australian microbiome manual. Um, and as well as the raw data, we produce process data through a standardised workflow. Um, and that's in the form of abundance table along with taxonomy. And we provide um, a few different versions of taxonomy with that, um, as well as some inferred trait data for the amplicons. Uh, and for metagenomics, at the moment, we produce functional gene abundance tables as well as assemblies and mags where we can. So where is our data? This is the um, Australian Microbiome Data Portal. You do have to register to be able to download data, but all that is is a, a tracking mechanism and it happens uh, instantly uh, and it doesn't cost anything. We have, this is when you're looking for the process data, um, we do have this way of being able to filter it where you can choose the amplicon of interest, um, you can choose the taxonomy you want and the method that was used to assign that taxonomy. You can filter down as far as you want if you only want a certain genus or you can take the entire data with you. Um, you can also choose by environment, so whether you're looking at marine or soil and you can add different contextual filters. So you could actually choose to download data within a salinity range, for example, or from just <clears throat> one specific site. Oh, and here is an example of how we've filtered to have um, uh, 16S data using the Silver 138 um, assigned using the sklearn method. I've asked for bacteria only, so that will filter out anything that was unassigned or assigned to the wrong kingdom. Um, I've asked for samples in the marine environment and I've filtered by funding agency to say, I just want IMOS funded samples. Um, and then it tells me there's nearly 3000 samples there and I can choose how I want to download that as an OTU table with contextual data or just the contextual data to see what's there, etc. So the crux of it is, in terms of the marine data set, we've got more than 7,000 samples in there at the moment. Um, they range from the ice edge to the equator, 
um, from 74 east to 174 west, water temps from you know below zero to the tropics and from depths from the surface to 6,000 metres um, and amplicons and metagenomes for those. And about 50% of that marine data set as I said, comes from IMOS. So it's those um, really robust time series data. And, you know, we think because of the way this work has been processed, um, standardised, you know, it, it's a really powerful data set in terms of its transparency, the standardisation, as I mentioned, and the scale. So I just wanted to give you a quick overview of um, the outputs, the, some of the things that we do with that data set. Um, obviously, Research, it's a, it's a fantastic data set for research from universities and institutions within Australia, outside of Australia, um, publications exploring microbiome dynamics, um, nutrient cycling, biogeographical patterns and indicators of ecosystem health. The data has also been used by other people to constrain or validate um, their analyses, you know, used as a baseline or a reference point for other more specific or localised analyses. And we also try and, um, as we mentioned uh, in the bio, um, you know, work with other people to develop um, workflows and contribute to method development and data standards. Um, and we really do try to connect as much as possible with different regional and international groups working towards the same goals. And last but certainly not least, you know, the scale and standardised nature of that data set means that it can be used for expert ecosystem assessments. So looking to track the status of our marine environments and whether those um, communities at the base of the food chain are remaining the same or changing. And that brings us to a more recent project, you know, how do we make that data more accessible to non-expert users? So we had the Mi Microbial Ocean Atlas project, um, which was funded by the Australian Research Data Commons alongside um, our other main co-investment agencies. And the focus of this project was to firstly distill these really large marine DNA sequencing data sets into meaningful metrics which could be understood and assessed by non-expert end users, but also to make these metrics visualizable and available alongside other environmental parameters. And this was achieved through the IMOS Biological Ocean Observer. And I really do encourage you to have a look at this platform um, at some point. The microbiome data in the form of indices and metrics can be visualised as simple time series plots. Or so for example, um, in this slide, you can see the microbial um, community, the bacterial temperature index at Mariah Island um, over nearly a decade. Um, you can look at different taxa abundance or functional gene abundances at different sites over time. The plots are all downloadable, uh, the data is downloadable and the code is too so that you can tweak it to your own needs. And you'll note that from the tabs it's not just the microbes, um, we also have uh, microscopy, um, phytoplankton and zooplankton data, as well as larval fish. Uh, you can explore the environmental data by itself. And while this is still in development phase, um, we do believe this is one of our really key pathways towards making that microbiome data available to non-expert end users. You can imagine a situation where someone doing an ecosystem assessment can just go in and choose the site and then download those time series data so they can look at change. And so with that in mind, I'll pass you to Lev, um, who's going to present in much more detail the development of those environmental indices and how we apply this to the marine heatwave event off the coast of Tasmania. Um, now, I just need to pass over the headset so that you'll be able to hear him uh, and he'll take over from here. Thank you, Jody. Um, so, um, <sighs> We took that um, uh, data set of the Australian microbiome, the marine part of the data set that uh, Jody was uh, describing, Jody described before, and took those observations on individual ASVs to develop species thermal indices, or in this case, it really is thermal indices for the observed ASVs of the bacterial, archaeal, and eukaryotic kingdom in the marine uh, environment. 
So, for example, here you see it over 2,000 data points on a, on a given bacterial ASV, and this uh, rich uh, set of observations was turned into uh, the thermal index of, of this particular ASV with a T temperature optimum, minimum, maximum, and temperature range defined. We also generated community-weight traits, so uh, in the sense of temperature or thermal indices, a community temperature index, which is the abundance-weighted average thermal affinity of the entire community, uh, community thermal range, the thermal diversity of the community, thermal bias, which I will come back to in a sec, and the sensitivity of the community thermal index to change in temperature. In particular, the thermal bias is a really interesting and useful index because it basically tells you how or indicates to you how much temperature stress a given microbial community or even community in our case, microbial community is experiencing at the time of the analysis. Uh, on this slide, you see the annual uh, patterns of the community thermal indices of the bacterial, archaeal, and eukaryote kingdoms at different uh, marine national reference stations of Australia. And if you focus on this first one from Murray Island, which is the location where our uh, story is really based, you see that in the summer months, which in the southern hemisphere means uh, December, January, February, and the early autumn months, uh, March and April, most of the bacteria and archaea community or the, or the bacteria and archaea community is in most of the time under uh, negative thermal stress, which means that the uh, in situ temperature exceeds the uh, thermal optimum of the, uh, the average thermal optimum of the community. <clears throat> Interestingly, uh, across all the stations, we see uh, a difference between the prokaryote communities and the eukaryote communities, where the eukaryotic communities seem to experience thermal stress much less frequently and less severely. And this is something which gets around what this really means in terms of uh, ocean warming and uh, biological response to it in the future. The full data set we created and released with this paper uh, includes uh, other species and community environmental indices, namely salinity, dissolved oxygen, nitrate and nitrite. This was uh, analyzed in combination, so we, we only have a nitrate and nitrate combined uh, number. Phosphate, silicate, chlorophyll, and we also analyzed uh, all three kingdoms of life, so bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. Uh, we used the generated indices to also cluster and classify assemblages based on these indices using M plus five pack package. Uh, and that uh, in the case of bacteria that resulted in uh, 20 different niche clusters where you see the distribution of these niche clusters along a temperature gradient, uh, salinity, uh, nitrate, nitrite, phosphate, silicate, and dissolved oxygen. Um, now, marine heat waves are periods when the seawater temperature exceeds a threshold, usually the 90th percentile, which varies with season and is uh, specific to any given location. And uh, this period has to be at least five consecutive days. So these are periods when basically when the marine environment experiences a significantly higher temperature for a significant time period. There are two different main, uh, there are two different types of marine heat waves. There are advective marine heat waves based on uh, ocean currents, so where the heat is carried to a lo uh, location by currents, and those that are uh, driven by local surface, surface heating. And the broad consequences of marine heat waves include physical and chemical consequences, so they lead to increased stratification, which decreases the available nutrients in the surface, lead lead to increased acidification and uh, deoxygenation. <clears throat> in terms of biology, they can lead to habitat compression, disruption of the food web, species migration, and mass mortalities. And they can lead to significant economic losses. Importantly, they are also a window. They also provide windows into the future where uh, the marine uh, waters will get warmer and warmer. These marine heat waves will 
get longer, more more uh, intensive, and eventually what we consider marine heat wave now <coughs> will be more the norm. Uh, there's a very good uh, online tool that I would like to draw your attention to that allows you to visualize the status of the global oceans in terms of uh, marine heat waves, heat waves at any uh, day in the past, I don't know how many years. <clears throat> and also allows you to look at the history of a given location. In this case, I chose the <clears throat> location of the Mirai Island National Reference Station. And, and the graph down here basically shows the onset and dissipation of the 2015-2016 marine heat wave that uh, our story is about. <clears throat> so Mirai Island is uh, uh, on the east coast of Tasmania near Hobart uh, at 42 degrees south. It's a temperate uh, marine environment, highly seasonal. So in the summer and late autumn months, temperature certification are uh, so temperature is much higher than in the winter leading to strong certification and a significant decrease in available nutrient levels compared to the winter months it's also strongly influenced by the east australian current that comes down from the coral sea along the east coast of australia all the way down to tasmania in 2015 2016 starting in about december and uh, carrying on until uh, the end of April, start of May, there was a an unprecedented heat wave, marine heat wave at uh, in the Tasman Sea, which we observed in particular at the Mirai, Mirai Island National Reference Station, where temperatures exceeded records that goes go back to 1944 and also surpassed the upper thermal boundaries of many of the endemic taxa. Uh, it's, it's a very complex graph that you see here on. Uh, where I'm pointing, <clears throat> but the first three lines show the, the more surface uh, layers that we were observing, so 0, 10, and uh, uh, 20 meters, and the, the other three lines show uh, deeper regions, and you see that the marine heat wave developed differently in surface and uh, deeper waters. Also, uh, kind of uh, showing the uh, the increasing certification that I mentioned in the summer months. Now, this uh, marine heat wave also led to a profound transition to niche states that are typically observed over 1,000 kilometers forwards in Sydney, uh, around Sydney and around Brisbane, which are subtropical to tropical uh, marine environments. And this was shown by the uh, marine community, the, it is uh, a figure on the bacterial communities at Mariah Island during the heat wave. So, this is uh, the start of 2016. They fell into those niche clusters that I mentioned before that are typically observed at Port Hacking, so up here near Sydney. And in some cases, into niche clusters that are typically observed. At Port Hacking and Ian, even more so at North Stradbrook Island, up to Sydney and up to Brisbane. We also saw observed changes in the tax taxonomic composition, as shown by a classic NMDS plot, where the dark blue triangles represent uh, samples uh, from Mariah Island during heat waves across the eight years that our uh, paper covered. <coughs> And the data points uh, in the red circle are from the 2015-2016 marine heat wave. So these are the data points that stick out the most. So we, we could see these changes with uh, kind of conventional analysis as well. But the, the, the this graph shows a, a much less clear and striking change than the, the previous analysis. Um, we could also identify the genera continue, that contributed most to the differences across those eight years of observations. So what you see here is a heat uh, map representation of how different clades were differentially uh, abundant in samples collected during heat waves versus samples collected during non-heat wave periods. Again, across the eight years, our observations were 
running and we also only show data from starting in October, which is uh, mid spring until the end of April, which is uh, the end of uh, the autumn, so the warm months. And uh, interestingly, special generator showed a, an increase in their abundant, relative abundance during marine heat waves where cyanobacteria and bacteria photoheterotrophs, whereas bacteria that, as, that showed a significant increase, decrease where bacteria that are usually associated with large phytoplankton aggregates like flavor bacteria and rosperialis. <clears throat> so when looking at all the different marine heat waves at Mariah Island over the 80s of observations, we found that they change and modulate seasonal patterns and their uh, strongest effect is observed during warm months, which kind of makes sense because this is when the communities, when a marine heat wave takes communities to a, a new state that they don't normally experience during the year. So when you add basically add heat to the, the hottest months. And in particular, I would like to draw your attention to this last graph where we show that in February, March and April, so this is uh, end of summer until the mid of autumn, the number of uncommon taxa found uh, at Mariah Island were significantly higher during heat wave, marine heat wave months uh, than uh, during normal non heat wave months. All the data I showed so far were from the bacterial kingdom. We also looked at archaea and eukaryotes, and we found similarly significant changes in the taxonomic composition as shown by NNDS plots. So, again, uh, red uh, shows the data points significant different data points from uh, the 2015-2016 marine heat wave, but we could not observe the same uh, niche state transitions based on the uh, cluster, the niche clusters as before. And we have some ideas of why that might be. In case of Archaea, we're thinking that they tend to respond to environmental changes more slowly. And in case of eukaryotes, the data are generally more <coughs> noisy just due to the size of the eukaryotes and, and how much uh, a two-liter sample is representative for them. <coughs> so the broader implications of uh, our finding is that generally we find that we found that the marine heat wave that we analyzed caused a shift towards smaller phytoplankton that are more suited to warm oligotrophic conditions and also to uh, photoheterotrophic uh, microbes which will have an implication on the food chain, uh, eventually leading to a shift in fish, fish populations, which has economic uh, consequences. Also, a change in the carbon sequestration potential of the ocean and potential other uh, flow-on effects on biogeochemistry and biology. Um, I just have a message saying I might be experiencing network connection difficulties. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can see your screen and we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, so in conclusion, <coughs> we have developed a framework for examining the impacts of environmental changes and pressures on microbial communities. This framework is, is able to distill complex microbial responses to simple and easy to communicate metrics. It provides a simple way to describe the niche differentiation within major taxa, which has a range of uh, potential applications. It's, it's suitable to identify where microbial communities are under critical environmental stress currently, but also in modeled future scenarios. And with that uh, tool, we could also focus on different sub uh, sections of the microbial community. So, for example, we could uh, pull out the part of the microbial community that is uh, found to play a significant role in marine uh, carbon sequestration and look where in the future the marine the carbon sequestration potential of the ocean might experience uh, significant changes. So therefore, uh, drastically improving uh, forecasts in that sense. And our results in particular for this marine heat wave show that marine heat waves and global warming will likely lead to major transitions, changing and disruption. And disrupt, uh, when transitions which will change and disrupt marine microbiota, biogeochemistry, food chain, and industries. And with that, we would like to 
thank you for uh, inviting us to give this talk and for you uh, for listening and also acknowledge our co-authors the sample sampling and process sampling processing crews both at the IMOS national reference stations and on the different voyages from which our data came and also uh, the different organizations uh, contributing to this work by funding and um, and data thank you very much Thank you, Love, and thank you, Jody, for the great presentation today. Um, very informative and exciting research going on. <clears throat> we'll now open the floor to questions by participants. We don't have any in there yet, but I have a question. Um, Lev, this one's for you. Um, could you cover or speak to the cadence or the preferred or ideal cadence or time frame? for these niche ecological assessments? Um, would, would you hope in the future to monitor real time, monthly, yearly, seasonally? Um, could you speak a little bit about future monitoring and the cadence for these assessments? Sorry, Nicole, I didn't quite get the question. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll repeat. So my question was, is there moving forward with, with these microbial ecological assessments, do you have a, a time frame or a cadence that you hope to conduct these assessments at moving forward in the future, whether that's seasonally, in real time, annually, or monthly, um, what would the preferred cadence be? Yeah, so, I mean, if, if I understand your question correctly, uh, the answer is we, we, we're hoping to maintain these observations into the future, which of course it uh, relies on uh, the support from a broad range of institutions and funding agencies and Our current time resolution varies between different uh, locations where we observe. We usually do observations on a monthly basis at the national reference stations. Uh, our voyage based observations so far are uh, not repeated. We actually have a lot of opportunities to carry out more voyage based observations, but I struggle to find enough funding to carry on to, to do them. We're also working uh, with uh, uh, engineers to, de to develop uh, devices that allow us to sample on a daily basis in uh, locations and during times where uh, we expect, expect some subtle change. I think Jody might be able to add something to that. No? Yeah. So, Thanks, yeah, so For example, we would like to do daily samplings in different locations, but it's not possible to do it with uh, mm -hmm. some human activity. So that's why we're working on these uh, devices. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Lev. Um, our first question, our second question today is from Elise, who asks or states, you suggested that these marine heat waves induced taxonomic changes may affect carbon sequestration. Could you speak a bit more about this hypothesis in terms of evidence so far or how you might go about assessing this in the future. Sure. So, from a very uh, broad perspective, uh, most uh, marine carbon sequestration activities are believed to be based on large phytoplankton, like diatoms. So, diatoms are uh, marine phytoplankton that is likely to sink or is it has the most potential to sink and as it sinks for forming aggregates uh, which is then um, colonized by uh, other bacteria or by bacteria and once uh, the phytoplankton community shifts to smaller phytoplankton in particular cyanobacteria its ability to sink is drastically reduced but what well, what we would like to do in the future is to analyze the actual composition of 
marine particles at depth, so at depths where uh, they already contribute to marine carbon sequestration. So this is currently believed to be below about a thousand meters. And analyze the, co the composition of it, what, uh, how much phytoplankton, what sort of phytoplankton, and, and how much bacterial biomass is sitting on them. And then use this data to go back to the uh, database we have, pull out all the ASVs that are observed on this uh, marine, and then go, okay, this part of the marine uh, microbiota in the surface waters is going to, is in currently in that status uh, based on the uh, community thermal index. It has so much thermal bias across the year, but this is going to change so and so in different locations based on future uh, marine uh, environmental scenario. Thanks, Lab. And then by that, identify where we expect significant changes and, and how, how we expect the, the, the global uh, ocean's capacity for carbon sequestration to change in the future. Thank you, Lab. And great, great question, Elise. Um, our next question is from Kelly, who says, um, I'm a PhD student from Oregon State University studying microbial communities off the coast of California. Something we see in our data is relatively homogeneous enrichment of SARS-11 clade 1A taxa. But when we look at the ASV level, the ASVs within the clade vary greatly based on oceanographic factors, such as upwelling. I'm wondering if you see similar small scale differences like this in the OTU level in response of changing in, in this response to changing environmental conditions. We haven't done that analysis, but I know that uh, Mark Brown, who is the first author of this paper that we presented today, has published quite a bit on uh, SAR-11 uh, clade one. And he also found that there is a there are two OTUs that dominate these surface waters in the different uh, national reference stations that we analyze. And they differ by only one nucleotide in the analyzed region, but they respond very differently to, uh, to, to subtle differences in the environment. I can't remember the exact details, but there is a paper by Mark Brown that you might want to look at on this. Love, could you repeat the end of that just real briefly? I think we lost you at one point. Uh, I f but the end was just there is this paper by Mike Brown that you might want to look at. Mike Brown. Details. Thanks, Love. Thank you. Um, with that, we don't have any more questions. Um, <clears throat> we can give it a minute or two. Um, I'd like to extend my sincerest gratitude to Lev and Jody for presenting today at the NOAA OMIC seminar series. It was a great presentation and we are very happy to have you. Um, and with that, we will uh, adjourn. Thank, thank you, you Lev. And thank you, Jody, today. Thank you. Alrighty guys, thank you so much. Our next NOAA OMIC seminar series will be in the third week of April. We look forward to seeing you there and um, you will receive emails about that shortly. Thank you everybody for joining today.